And thank you, Jonathan, for that wonderful introduction uh, and to the Kemper family for all that they do for so many different institutions, including my own Harvard. It's a tremendous honor to hold the David Woods Kemper Chair in American History. Uh, I, think, I think about it quite often uh, when I sign my name <laughs> and, and put my title below. So I do think it's such a monument um, to endow a professorship. Uh, it's such a kind of living tie between the past and the present, which happens to be something that interests me a great deal, the relationship between the past and the present. I spend most of my days living in the past, and I feel I have to swim my way to the surface uh, of the present and poke my head above like a, like a, a sea mammal <laughs> to fill my lungs with the air of the present day before I dive back down to the past. I want to talk this evening about a book that I have been working on for many years about Benjamin Franklin's sister Jane. And I have some lectures I'm going to show you, I mean some slides I'm going to show you, but I'm also going to read a little bit uh, from portions of the book as well, because I want to give you some sense of the larger story of Jane's life. But specifically, I actually want to talk about how hard it is to write the life of someone like Jane Franklin. And I, I want to do that by talking about Jane Franklin's spectacles. In 1771, Benjamin Franklin sent his sister Jane a pair of spectacles. Or rather, he sent her 13 pairs of spectacles with lenses of every size from 1 to 13. And then he sent her to instructions. He was a very thorough man. <laughs> instructions for conducting her own eye exam. Take out a pair at a time and hold one of the glasses first against one eye and then against the other, looking upon some small print. If the first pair suits neither eye, put them up again before you open a second. I advise you trying each of your eyes separately because few people's eyes are fellows. <laughs> there were no optometrists in the 18th century. So if you needed eyeglasses, this is what you had to do. You actually had to have available to you a whole set of, of glasses and then you'd try them out and you'd pop pop the glasses out, the lenses out of the frame, until you came up with a pair that worked for you. Franklin said, give away all the weaker pairs, but save the stronger ones, because surely you'll need them eventually. Uh, but this eye exam, it's a little bit, you know when you go to the optometrist and they put that horrible contraption over your whole face, and then they flip the lenses, and it's like, which is better, A or B? And they all look the same. <laughs> you always feel like, I'm failing the test. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so Franklin's trying to explain to Jane, she's in Boston, he's in London, what to do, how to, how to do this with these 13 pairs of glasses. But the thing I love about it, uh, it's a quite a loving gift, and in, in the, the letter is quite loving, but I love that <laughs> few people's eyes are fellows. What does it mean to be one of a pair? That's the question I ask myself about. Jane Franklin, who was Benjamin Franklin's twin in many ways. Benjamin Franklin was born in Boston in 1706. This is a record of his birth from the family record book. His sister Jane was born six years later. He was the youngest of ten sons. She was the youngest of seven daughters. This is the point where all the women go, oh, that's 17. <laughs> There were two mothers. The first one had ten, and the, the first one had seven, and the second had ten, which doesn't make it actually a lot uh, <laughs> clearer. <that it's laughs> they were the youngest of the seventeen children. Benny and Jenny, they were called when they were little. No two people in their family were more alike. Jane thought of her brother, wrote about her brother as her second self. They were, after a fashion, twins, like a pair of eyes. I think about this a lot. My next older brother is just not much older than I am. He's 13 months older, and his name is Jack. We grew up as Jack and Jill, so when I think about <laughs> Benny and Jenny, I know what that's like to be paired in that way. Uh, what does that mean, though, for biography? What, is that, what does it mean to have grown up the little sister of, of Benjamin Franklin? Is there any way that we can see her life when we know so much about his? Their lives, if, however alike they were, and people uniformly commented on so, so many similarities in their temperament and their liveliness, their lives could hardly have been more different. Benjamin Franklin ran away from home when he was 17. His sister never left. He taught himself to write with wit and force and style. She never learned how to spell. The day he turned 21, the day he came of age and became a man, 
He wrote her a letter. It was the first letter he sent home after he ran away. She was 14 years old then. Beginning there with that letter, a correspondence that would last until his death 63 years later. He became a printer, a philosopher, and a statesman. She became a wife, a widow, a, a wife, a widow, a mother. He signed the Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of Paris, and the Constitution. She strained to form the letters of her name. He loved no one longer. She loved no one better. Benjamin Franklin wrote more letters to his sister Jane than he wrote to anyone else. All her life, she wrote back, letter after letter, filled with news and recipes and gossip. And when she was truly sorely vexed, but only then, with her blistering opinions about politics. He wrote the story of his life, the private life of Benjamin Franklin, it was called. A well-turned tale about a boy who runs away from a life of poverty and obscurity in cramped, pious Boston and leaves all that behind, leaves home behind, leaves his sister behind, leaves ignorance behind, leaves the past behind, to become an educated, enlightened, independent man of the world. This is how he wanted himself pictured. This is a portrait painted of Franklin in 1767, just a few years before he sent Jane that pair of spectacles. What? This is Franklin's favorite portrait of himself a man born the son of a poor candle maker in Boston. Why did he love this portrait above all others? Because it portrays him, a man of, is, portrays him as a man of books, a man of learning, a man of science, a man of papers, a man of letters, a spectacle. 1771, the year Benjamin Franklin sent his sister spectacles, is also the year he began writing the story of his life. It wasn't published until after his death in 1790, but it very quickly became one of the most important autobiographies ever written. It even helped invent the genre. It wasn't called an autobiography because the word had not yet been coined. Franklin helped define the conventions of writing the story of your own life. He wrote the story of his life as an allegory, an allegory about America, the story of a man as the story of a nation. A man who runs away, breaks free, rebels against tyranny, escapes poverty, rises to wealth through the sweat of his own brow. A self-made man, rags to riches. This, Franklin thought, was his story as the story of America. He wrote and made his private life public so that he would be a spectacle for all the world to see and to learn from. In that story, he left his sister out. Never once did he so much as mention her name. Where does that leave Jane and her poor, unfortunate biographer? One half the world does not know how the other half lives, was Benjamin Franklin who once wrote. I think one way to think about Jane Franklin is that she is his other half. And if his life is an allegory, so is hers. But an allegory for what? She's our other half, in a way, to the other half of America. Her life, though, was not a spectacle. It's actually very difficult even to see her life. Next to his, her life seems so tiny. His fame is matched only by her obscurity. He is a spectacle. She is a speck. So I wondered, might there be a pair of eyeglasses that could help me to see them both at once? No portrait of Jane Franklin survives. She was never wealthy enough to have a portrait painted of herself. She couldn't be, can't be seen in that way. There are, of course, dozens of portraits of her brother. His popularity, he wrote to her from France, has occasioned so many paintings to be made of me that my face is now almost as well known as that of the moon. <laughs> Franklin had no use for vanity. He had, uh, for, 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 he had no use for uh, denial of vanity. He thought that vanity was a very useful thing to have. But. Uh, Jane wrote back, yes, and your face is apparently as changeable as the moon. <laughs> he often insisted on being painted wearing his eyeglasses. The historian Catherine Stebbins McCaffrey once made a count and found that Franklin is wearing spectacles in more than a third of all his surviving portraits. This is all the more extraordinary when you realize that, port that spectacles appear on the faces of almost no one else in the 18th century in portraiture. If you do a kind of keyword search across catalog collections of, of 18th century portraits looking for spectacles, 
You may find some in the picture, but you almost never find them on people's faces. That is partly because people did not wear them except to read. He liked this portrait best. Why did he care so much about being portrayed wearing spectacles? The story of spectacles is, in fact, quite important because it's a story about the history of reading. Spectacles are an emblem in the 18th century of a life of the mind. People have, of course, used glass as a magnifier for a very long time. <coughs> But eyeglasses, pieces of glass that are cut and framed and used, held over your eyes, over your face, those only became in any way common in the 17th century. They were used almost exclusively for reading. So the rise of eyeglasses is in fact completely tied up with the rise of printing and the expansion of literacy. They, they, they follow a similar trajectory. People used spectacles to read printed books. So the first popular spectacles appeared in London only in the 17th century here uh, in an advertisement, a, a trades card from 1644. These are called nose spectacles or bridge spectacles because they sit on the bridge of your nose. They don't have what we call arms to, to, to these glasses. They're, they, they just sort of kind of prop there, and which is uh, fine because you're only using them when you're reading, so you might prop them in your, in your reading, but you wouldn't walk around the room with them. No one would do that. That would be a bizarre thing to do. <laughs> so when you see them in portraits, r early portraits, when you begin, when they're first are, when bridge spectacles are first available in the middle of the 17th century, uh, people still aren't wearing them. This, <laughs> can you spot the spectacles <laughs> in this picture? It's a little like a Where's Waldo. You, you, I think I have a little, yeah, you can see them, right? These are the time. Okay. Uh, those are nose spectacles, and you wouldn't wear them to be painted, and that would be bizarre. You'd only wear them, because if, if you're being painted, you're not actually reading. Here, you're showing that you have them because you have a book, you know how to read. The reason you would be portrayed with your spectacles is to signify that you are an intellectual, which is basically what this is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's an emblem of a life of the mind. This is Richard Mather, the Puritan minister of Dorchester, Massachusetts, in a portrait from 1670. So not very many people had spectacles. There, it was the first time you could buy them, but it was still incredibly rare. Only the very learned, Mather was quite a learned man, would have spectacles. And then you would never see anybody with their spectacles. You'd, they, you'd, they'd, you'd look at them, use them when you were at your desk. But the existence of spectacles, that some people had them in an age of Isaac Newton's optics, inspired all kinds of thinking about the nature of sight, ideas about perspective and point of view and distortion. John Donne observed that when thou lookest through spectacles, small things seem great. Spectacles made small things bigger. This was fascinating. Wearing them, thinking about lenses, also inspired reflections on the nature of the self, on the nature of sympathy and moral imagination. John Locke wrote, I think we may as rationally hope to see with other men's eyes as to know by other men's understandings. Richard Steele, writing in the aptly named Spectator in 1711, remarked that a man's eyes are spectacles to those who look at him to read his heart. Wearing spectacles then marked Franklin in a very particular way as a man of discernment. He could see. More plainly, they marked him as a prodigious reader. He is a man of letters, what we would call an intellectual. As a child, Franklin had studied almost incessantly, read almost incessantly. He read his Bible before the age of five, Jane said. A lot of what we know about Franklin's early child, in fact, comes from Jane, because people would make a pilgrimage to meet her in Boston and ask her all about Benjamin Franklin, and they would write little notes down about what they learned about her from Frank, about Franklin's childhood. They never asked her anything about herself, <laughs> so therefore have no information about when Jane learned to read. Uh, their father was a poor candle maker, but Benjamin Franklin was clearly so bright that their father, uh, Josiah Franklin, decided to send Benny to school. None of his other children had gone to school. He had put all of his other sons to trades, but he decided to give one of his ten sons, a tenth of his sons, the tithe of his sons, to the church. To become a, to become a minister, to be given to the church, one had to learn Latin and Greek and go to Harvard. This is the only way to become a minister in 18th century Massachusetts. So in 1714, when Jenny was two and Benny was eight, he entered Boston's South Grammar School where he studied Latin and Greek. He was spent only two years there. It was the only education Benjamin Franklin really ever had. 
His father pulled him out, he ran out of money, and sent him to a cheaper school on Hanover Street where he spent only a matter of months because his father ran out of money to keep him there and decided to keep him at the shop, dipping candles, making molds, boiling soap, and going on errands. Franklin hated it, and he began to think he might run away. What about Jane? Her parents could not have sent her to school. No public school in Boston admitted girls at the time. Beginning in 1701, the Massachusetts Poor Laws, under which the Franklin family would have fallen, required teaching boys to write and girls to read. You'd be taught that generally at home. For most girls, book learning ended there. The idea was that everybody needed to learn to read. These are Puritans, they're Protestants. They need, in order to be saved, you need to read the Bible and study the Bible. But only boys needed to learn how to write. Reading and writing were always taught completely differently. At home and at school, if they went, boys were taught to read and write. Girls were taught to read and then to stitch. <laughs> boys held quills. Girls held needles. In 1710, three in five women in New England could not even sign their names. And the two in five women who could sign their names could usually do no more writing than that. It was quite common to learn the mechanical craft of writing your name, signing your name. That's not the same thing as knowing how to write. A Boston newspaper printed a dialogue between a thriving tradesman and his wife about the education of their daughter. The wife wishes to send the girl to school. The husband refuses, telling her, Pretty good, madam, let her first be able to read a chapter truly in the Bible, that she mayn't mispronounce God's people popel, nor read constable for Constantinople. Make her expert and ready at her prayers, that God may keep her from the devil's snares. Teach her what's useful, how to shun deluding, to roast, to toast, to boil, and mix a pudding, to knit, to spin, to sew, or make, or mend, to scrub, to rub, to earn, and not to spend. I tell thee, wife, once more, I'll have her bread to bookery, cookery, thimble, needle, and thread. <laughs> this was Jane Franklin's education. She was bred to bookery, cookery, thimble, needle, and thread. She cut the wick and dipped the candles and did the work her brother hated. She boiled soap. Why then did she one day need reading glasses? Jane Franklin did learn how to read the way most girls learned how to read, but then she read avidly, she read passionately, she read all her life. And she learned too how to write. And I think it was Benjamin, her brother, who taught her. He fought for his own learning letter by letter, book by book, candle by candle. He valued nothing more. He loved his little sister. But it was cruel in its kindness, because when he left and ran away, the lessons ended. In 1717, when Jenny was five, her brother James set up a printing shop in Boston. For Benny, this was a godsend. It changed Benjamin Franklin's life. Here at last was a trade for the bookish boy too poor to go to Harvard. In 1718, he became his brother's apprentice. He moved into a room above James's shop. Benny was 12, Jenny was six. The best part of his apprenticeship, Franklin always said, was the chance it gave him to read. At home, he had only been able to read the books in his father's very scant library. Plutarch's Lives, a book of Defoe's called An Essay on Projects, another of Cotton Mather's called Essays to Do Good, but almost all of the books in Josiah Franklin's library were sermons. These were the books Jenny read too. But working at a printer shop was as good as working at a bookshop. Benjamin Franklin traded books with all the other printer's apprentices in town. He read every book that found its way into the port of Boston during the years that he worked at that printing shop. He stayed up, as he wrote in his autobiography, the greatest part of the night reading by candlelight. His best friend was another bookish lad in town, John Collins by name. Franklin wrote about Collins in his autobiography. The thing he remembered about Collins was how much they liked to stage debates, like university men, they said. The only debate Franklin remembered, though, was a debate the two boys had over the propriety of educating the female sex. Young Collins was of the opinion that it was improper and that girls were naturally unequal to it, Franklin wrote. Franklin took the other side. He framed his argument by referring to one of the books in his father's library, Daniel Defoe's Essays on Projects. Defoe had proposed the establishment of an academy for women. I have often thought of it as one of the most barbarous customs in the world 
considering us as a civilized and Christian country, that we deny the advantages of learning to women. Their youth is spent to teach them to stitch and sew or make baubles. They are taught to read indeed, and perhaps to write their names or sew. And that is the height of a woman's education. Defoe's Academy for Women, this project of his, would embrace every subject, he explained. To those who such whose genius would lead them to it, I would deny no sort of learning. This then was the argument that Benjamin Franklin made in this little debate he had, play debate, with his friend John Collins. He used Defoe's arguments and made them. To, then they, they had this sort of framed a debate where they kind of hashed it out in person, and then they continued the debate letter by letter, sending rebuttals back and forth. One day, Josiah Franklin came across this, this stash of letters and read them, and he sat his son Benjamin down at the kitchen table and explained to him the deficiencies in his argument. He didn't take a side in the dispute. He just told Franklin that his, his arguments were deficient in rhetoric and could be improved. Think about that moment. While Benjamin Franklin was improving his writing by arguing about the education of girls, his sister Jane was dipping candles and stitching. Quietly, with what time she could spare, she seems, though, to have been doing more. She once confided to her brother, I read as much as I dare. In 1721, Jenny and Benny's brother James bought his first pair of spectacles at a shop in Boston. He was 24. That year, he also began printing a newspaper, the New England Current. Benny set the type, but what he wanted to do was write. Franklin always wanted to be a writer. And so he knew his brother James would never publish anything that he had printed. His, he, they did not get along, and James did not think highly of his young rascally apprentice. So Franklin disguised his handwriting, gave himself a pen name, and then slipped a submission under the printing house door. James thought it was brilliant and masterful and hilarious, and it is all those things. And he printed it, not just that one essay, but a whole series of essays by this amazing, talented writer by the name of Silence Do-Good. <laughs> She introduced herself in the first of her letters with an essay on the significance of ordinary lives. Histories of lives are seldom entertaining unless they contain something either admirable or exemplary. And since there is little or nothing of this in, my nat in the nature of my own adventures, I will not tire your readers with tedious particulars of no consequence, but will briefly, and in as few words as possible, relate the most material occurrences of my life, and according to my promise, confine all to this letter. In this letter, the first of her letters to the New England Current, Silence Do Good has to tell the story of her life because every woman writer did in order to explain how she came to be that oxymoron that was a woman writer. <laughs> if you were a woman writing, you needed to explain why you were able to write. Silence Do Good's explanation was interesting. She said she was born on a ship that was crossing the Atlantic. Her father was so excited at the news of his, her birth that he fell overboard and drowned. Her mother was too poor to keep her, and she sent her to, the, the, to be raised by a country minister who had extraordinarily liberal views about female education. His views were those of Daniel Defoe. <laughs> he endeavored that I might be instructed in all that knowledge and learning which is necessary for our sex, and denied me no accomplishment that could possibly be attained in a country place, such as all sorts of needlework, writing, arithmetic, etc., and observing that I took more than ordinary delight in reading ingenious books, he gave me the free use of his library, which though it was but small, yet it was well chose to inform the understanding rightly and enable the mind to frame great and noble ideas. Silence do good, in other words, had spent much of her childhood, as she said, with the best of company books. Think about this moment. When Jenny was 10 and Benny was 16, he broke out upon the literary stage. These essays are cherished today as some of the most funny, the funniest of Franklin's satires, they, and rightly so. He broke out upon the literary stage, disguised as a woman whose girlhood was spent reading books. <laughs> Has nobody ever noticed this before? That maybe sounds do good is Jane Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, after he wrote these silence do good essays in 1722, ran away from home in 1723. He was 17, Jane was 11. She was a reader. A question we might ask, though, was she a writer? 
Virginia Woolf once asked, what would have happened had Shakespeare had a wonderfully gifted sister called Judith? Wolf then gave herself permission to invent this Judith Shakespeare. There was no Judith Shakespeare. Let me imagine, since facts are so hard to come by, and conjured a girl as brilliant and daring as her brother. Wolf wrote, she was as adventurous, as imaginative, as agog to see the world as he was, but she was not sent to school. She had no chance of learning grammar and logic, let alone of reading Horace and Virgil. She picked up a book now and then, one of her brothers perhaps, and read a few pages. But then her parents came in and told her to mend the stockings or mind the stew and not moon about with books and papers. What, Wolf wondered, would have been this Judith Shakespeare's fate? Before she was out of her teens, she was to be betrothed to the son of a neighboring wool stapler. She cried out that marriage was hateful to her, and for that she was severely beaten by her father. Then he ceased to scold her. He begged her instead not to hurt him, not to shame him in this matter of her marriage. He would give her a chain of beads or a fine petticoat, he said, and there were tears in his eyes. How could she disobey him? How could she break his heart? Judith Shakespeare, in this fictitious imagining, did break her father's heart. She ran away. The force of her gift drove her to it, Wolf wrote. She runs away to London, hoping for a career on the stage, but is instead seduced by an actor finding herself pregnant by that gentleman, Wolf writes, who shall measure the heat and violence of the poet's heart when caught and tangled in a woman's body, she killed herself one winter's night. She was not yet 17. Judith Shakespeare is a figment of Virginia Woolf's imagination. A heroine trapped skirts a flutter in a modern manly idea of the self and of the author as the self, solitary and unencumbered, a free man. She cannot live when she is pregnant. She must die. She cannot be an artist and a mother at the same time. Because Judith Shakespeare could not reconcile a life of the mind with the life of a mother. Neither could Virginia Woolf. The facts of Jane Franklin's life are hard to come by. Most of what she wrote is lost. And what scant record of her life has left has been saved only because she was Benjamin Franklin's sister. But Jane Franklin is not a figment of my imagination. She was flesh and blood and milk and tears. Her brother ran away and broke their father's heart. She would not. She could not do that. She never gave herself that much rope. She was betrothed to the neighboring wool stapler when she was 15, but she didn't kill herself one winter's night. She never gave herself that kind of rope either. She had too many people to look after. She never let anyone behind. She barely ever left the house. She didn't have a room of her own until she was 69 years old. I write now in my own little chamber and nobody up in the house near to disturb me, she wrote then, delighted. She was very happy to have that room, but not having had it sooner is not why she did not write more or better. In 1723, after Benjamin Franklin ran away, he settled in Philadelphia, where he opened a printing shop like his brother. A revolution in eyewear began that decade when the temple spectacle was invented. This is one of those things you think, like, how did it take them a whole century to figure out to put arms on these things? <laughs> but it did. It was a huge thing. Think about that innovation. Google Glass is nothing compared to <laughs> coming up. I was telling you, the guy that figured that out, that was a smart idea. These are called temple spectacles because they have arms that go along your temples, right? Uh, Benjamin Franklin began selling temple spectacles at his shop in Philadelphia in 1730 when he was 24, which is also when he first began wearing spectacles, the same age at which his brother had needed spectacles. You'd sell spectacles in a printing shop because they were closely associated with reading a book. Franklin, at first, when he first got spectacles, probably used them the way any other person who used spectacles did, only in his house while reading with a book in front of his face. Um, but then he did something different. He decided to get another pair to wear while walking around the street so that he could see things that were far away. Now, nobody but Benjamin Franklin walked down the street wearing spectacles. It would be like walking around with a toothbrush hanging out of your mouth. <laughs> like, it's just a really bizarre thing to do. And everybody commented, this is a, this is a, a strange, strange man. Ben Benjamin Franklin loved that, of course. He, he, he was a man who adored attention, uh, his own distinctiveness, uh, his own eccentricities. He was a young man on the make. This was a way to distinguish himself from all other young men, a display 
a very ostentatious display of his learning, of his very ingenious mind. Uh, and it was indeed ingenious because, of course, the next thing Benjamin Franklin did was invent bifocals. He later explained, I had formerly two pairs of spectacles, which I shifted occasionally, as in traveling I sometimes read and often want to regard the prospects. Finding this change, change troublesome, I'm picturing him in the carriage, he's got his book and he's reading with his reading glasses and he wants to look out the window at a beautiful view and he has to switch glasses. Finding this change troublesome and not always sufficiently ready, I had the glasses cut and half of each kind associated in the same circle. By this means, as I wear my spectacles constantly, I have only to move my eyes up or down as I want to see distinctly far or near, the proper glasses being always ready. Of course, a brilliant idea. I benefit from it every day. <laughs> uh, many of us in this room probably benefit from this idea. But it's almost as though Benjamin Franklin had left behind a clue explaining how to solve the dilemma of writing the story of two people, how to write a binocular biography. There's a lesson here about the writing of history, I think, because the historian needs two different lenses, too, one to see up close and one to see far away, one to write the life of the great, and one to write the life of the small. I got quite obsessed with this notion of writing a, 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 a bifocal biography when working on the life of Jane. It seemed to me to solve so many, so many problems at once. If only I had a pair of the spectacles that Jane had, I got to thinking. I got to wondering what her glasses looked like. There is uh, no extant 18th century portrait of a woman actually wearing spectacles on her face. There are a few portraits from the very late 18th century of women who hold spectacles. You can see here these spectacles that she has in her hand resting on the book to remind us that these are reading glasses. She is a woman of great learning. She reads. That's this portrait says, I'm a fancy lady. Look at my lovely outfit and my gown and, and my shawl and my book. I'm, I'm quite learned. Uh, from the same period as this, slightly less charming portrait <laughs> uh, with uh, these spectacles. Again, I'm, a, I'm, I'm quite a fine reader. I have an active mind. I also, this thing right here, I'm dying for someone to explain what that is. It doesn't look like it would have her teeth in it. She looks like she has her teeth down there. In the, in the, <laughs> the, the, the little thing. I mean, it's probably snuff. But um, right? anyway, the, the closest to a portrait from the 18th century of a woman wearing glasses is this, I think of this as the Hillary Clinton look. The, you know, <laughs> Hillary Clinton's like that. <laughs> She's got her glasses up on her, her like, little turban. Uh, women just did not want to have glasses on their face. No, nor did men. There did very few portraits. Of the only men other than Franklin who have themselves painted wearing spectacles are portrait painters who are making a self-portrait. And then actually they use their glasses to do the work and it's about their sight. It's a, it's a portrait to portray someone who was a seer wearing the device that allows them to see. It's just a whole play with the art of seeing. It makes sense that a portrait, Rembrandt Peel, is a beautiful self-portrait of Rembrandt Peel wearing spectacles. In any case, I got fascinated with these, this question of women and spectacles. I got pretty obsessed with it. And I decided I really wanted to have some glasses. I figured Jane's probably looked a lot like this woman's glasses. These, these are kind of like a steel, cheaper steel version of the, this woman is clearly wealthier, and she's got these sort of like, you know, brass, a nicer metal. I figured Jane's probably look like that. Well, it turns out <coughs> you can buy these glasses online. Um, and I bought some, and I, I brought mine with me. I always teach with props because I'm a very gimmicky person. And I, so I brought my Jane Franklin glasses. I'll show, show you how awful they are. I can't see out of them. I keep them on, but I, I, I'm too cheap to risk put my prescription in here. So, so I'm already like dizzy trying to. In any case, I got, um, I, I was really excited to have them. It turns out it was interesting where I had to buy them. The motto of the shop amuses me no end. <laughs> or Jane, also Jane, shop there. Um, it's a, you know, re Revolutionary War reenactors <laughs> equipment shop. Um, anyway, I put the spectacles on and I, you know, really, I, I got excited. It was fun. Uh, but one of the things that really was actually helpful about doing it was just actually the act of doing it. So if you have glasses on, take them off for a minute. 
And, you know, we all now are collectively, like, my adrenaline goes up when I have my glass. I feel like I'm going to be attacked and then, <laughs> and then I can't defend myself. Uh, I feel extremely vulnerable and, and weirdly, inexplicably exposed when I don't have my glasses on. Uh, and then if you put your glasses back on, one thing that, you know, when, when it was so new, when, when someone wearing spectacles was not unlike as, as rare as it is for someone to be wearing Google Glass today, uh, they, they really, I think, changed how people thought about their self, self and others. Like, it kind of frames your self, like it's a window and a door, and you have an inside and an outside, and all things we associate with the rise of individualism and modernity. You can kind of see, if a lot of people start wearing glasses, something kind of changes, and people begin to think differently about how do other people see, and how am I seen, and all that kind of John Locke, John Dunn stuff. You can, you can, there's something, something really going on there. So uh, wearing my Jane Franklin bifocals, I thought again about Benjamin Franklin and how he liked to be portrayed here. This is Isaac Newton as this bust. So this, this whole, him wearing his spectacles, looking at Isaac Newton, and like, I think one of the books might be Newton's Optics. It's a whole play about sight and insight, right? And then I thought about Virginia Woolf. And if you look at these two in a kind of, you know, binocular way, one thing that's interesting is how much these two portraits have in common, right? Uh, we, we almost take it for granted that a writer or a thinker will be portrayed this way. You know, this, this is like the gentleman in his study kind of portrait here, seated and slightly more relaxed, you know, with his books and papers. Uh, it's all about the solitude. It's, for Virginia Woolf, she is a, a writer of fiction. She looks in the distance. It's, you, it's an act of imagination, the work that's going on inside of her head. Franklin is a scholar and a statesman and a philosopher. He's studying books. But the, the idea that they share is one about the writer as solitary, among other things, alone in his study or her study. In a way, then, when you think about that and how conventional that notion is, Franklin really does a lot to shape that notion. But the story told in these portraits is actually the same as the story told in Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. That is to say, the story in which he left his sister out because a story about a writer who's alone, a man who rises from poverty to wealth only through the, his own efforts and not with the help of others, is a story that Jane cannot be in. So what about Jane? She was not unencumbered. She was hardly ever alone. She also never wrote the story of her life. This would never have occurred to her. But she did once make a little book. She stitched four sheets of fool's cap between two covers to make a little book of 16 pages. It looks like this. I once went uh, to the conservation lab uh, in one of Harvard's libraries and worked with um, restore book restorators to make some 18th century fool's cap of the same thickness of Jane's little book and made, made a cover for it. And this is this exact replica <laughs> of Jane's little book and what the blank pages look like. This, you know, we made the paper by hand, and we made the thread, and then we stitched the book together. It's this tiny, it's like a scrap of burlap. I mean, it's the most humble, little, uh, cheap, homemade thing, homely. Uh, <clears throat> she called it her book of ages. It's not an autobiography. It is instead a list of the births and deaths of her children. It is a litany of grief. It is not the story of a rise from rags to riches. It is a record in brief of a life lived from rags to rags. It is only 16 pages, and as I turned them, I discovered that she had left most of its pages blank. And this was worse than not finding anything at all, in a way. She had paper, she had a pen. Had she nothing more to say? Why are the blank page? But then I took out my Jane Franklin spectacles again, and I paged through Jane's book. And I began to think that Benjamin Franklin's sister had something to say after all, something quite different than Judith Shakespeare had said. I once more turned the brittle pages of the Book of Ages, and in them I thought I saw an unwritten story, a history of books and papers, a history of reading and writing, a history of men and women, a history of history, because Jane Franklin's Book of Ages is a book of ages about ages of books. So I want to tell you a little bit of the story that I've tried to piece together 
to stitch together of her life, a life unwritten. And it begins with this book of ages and my attempt to make one myself to try to understand what it meant to this woman whose brothers were printers to make a book, to start writing a book and to abandon it. Her paper was made from rags, soaked and pulped and strained and dried. Her thread was made from flax, combed and spun and twisted and dyed. On a table, she laid down a sheet of fool's cap and smoothed it with the palms of her hands. She creased it and folded it and folded it again and pressed it open. She used a needle to stitch a seam. It made the slimmest of volumes no thicker than a patch of burlap. She then dipped the nub of a pen slit from the feather of a bird into a pot of ink boiled of oil mixed with soot. And on the first page she wrote these three words, Book of Ages. In the most fashionable hand she could write. She never anywhere else wrote in such a fancy way. There is an error here. Misplaced apostrophe. <laughs> Jane did not know anything about punctuation. But this writing, this is called the flourishing alphabet. It's something Jane would have learned out of a book that her brother printed called The American Instructor or Young Man's Best Companion, a guide for young men learning to write with a flourishing hand that might distinguish them in their affairs. Then she turned the page. And at the top of the next, in a small cramped hand, her ordinary hand, she began her chronicle, Jane Franklin, born on March 27th, 1712. Uh, if you don't spend a lot of time in the 18th century the way I do, it can be a little hard to look at 18th century manuscripts. So I've transcribed these entries for you that I want to talk about. Below the record of her own birth, she added, Edward Meekham married to Jane Franklin, the 27th of July, 1727. The book of ages, possessive, whose age? Her age, born March 27, 1712, married July 27, 1727. She was 15 years and four months old when she married. She was a child. The legal age for Massachusetts, in Massachusetts for marriage was 16. The average age was 24, which is also the age, excepting Jane, that all of her sisters and brothers married at. Benjamin Franklin married at the age of 24. Her mother married at 22, which was considered quite young. Marrying at 15 is almost unheard of. It requires getting your parents' permission, and it is a very bad sign. Edward Meekham, the man Jane Franklin married, was poor. He lived next door. He was a saddler, and he was a Scot. He wore a wig and a beaver hat. She never once wrote anything about him expressing the least affection. Below, she added another line. Josiah Meekham, their firstborn on Wednesday, June the 4th, 1729. And below that, one more. And died May the 18th, 1730. The child of her childhood died three weeks shy of his first birthday. A dead child is a sight no more surprising than a broken pitcher. Cotton Mather preached in a sermon called Right Thoughts in Sad Hours. One in four children died before the age of 10. The dead were wrapped in linen, dipped in melted wax, while a box made of pine was built and painted black. Puritans, though, banned prayers for the dead. At the grave, there would be no sermon, nor, ministers warned, ought there to be tears. A sermon printed the year Jane buried her firstborn son called The Advice of Christ to a Distressed Mother Bewailing the Death of Her Dear and Only Son, cited Luke chapter 7, verse 13, Weep Not. What remains of a life? Remains means what remains of the body after death. But remains also means unpublished papers. And our descendants are our remains. The Boston poet Anne Bradstreet wrote about her children as her little babes, her dear remains. But Bradstreet's poems were her children too, thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, she called them. Her words were all, were all that her children would one day have left of her. Her poems would be her only remains. If chance to thine eyes shall bring this verse, she told her children, 
kiss this paper. Jane did not know how to write a poem. She couldn't have afforded a gravestone. Instead, she went home, stitched together a book, and wrote a book of remembrance. In 1733, Jane Franklin Meekham turned 21. She came of age. Her brother sent her a gift, the gift of a book, a copy of the Ladies' Library in three volumes. On its flyleaf, she wrote, Jane Meekham, her book given her by her brother, Benjamin Franklin, 1733. And she wrote, you probably also noticed her name on the title page. Benjamin Franklin, of course, knew a great deal about libraries. In 1731, he had founded the first lending library in America, the Library Company of Philadelphia. He once explained why the Library Company of Philadelphia was so important, what it had meant to him, not just the society that he created around it, the work he did in building together a community of gentlemen who could share books and share knowledge one with another in this jointly held subscription library, but what it meant to him as a boy who had meant to go to Harvard and whose father had pulled him out of school after two years. He explained, this library afforded me the means of improvement by constant study, for which I set apart an hour or two each day, and thus repaired in some degree the loss of the learned education my father had once intended for me. This gift he gave to Jane the day she turned 21 was meant to do the same for her. Its premise was stated on the first page of the first volume. It is a great injustice to shut books of knowledge from the eyes of women. Jane Franklin gave birth to 12 children in 24 years. Her belly swelled and emptied and swelled again. Her breasts filled and emptied and filled again. Her days were days of flesh. The little legs and little arms, the little hands clutched around her neck. The softness, a baby in her arms, she stared into kettles and tubs, swaying. The days passed to months, the months to years, and in her book of ages, she pressed her children between the pages. She did not have an hour or two each day to devote to reading that Franklin had. Her husband fell into debt. He appears to have gone mad. Two of her sons became violently insane. They had to be locked up. Jane and her children lived with her parents. She never moved out. When she married Edward Meekham when she was 15, he simply moved in. He's not a charming fellow. <laughs> she nursed her parents in their old age. This was understood to be the duty of the youngest daughter. The daughter of my old age, a woman would call her youngest daughter. She gave birth to 12 children in 24 years, and she buried 10 of them. Sorrows roll upon me like the waves upon the sea, she once wrote to her brother. I am hardly allowed time to fetch my breath. I am broken with breach upon breach. She begged God, what have I more? The reason she stopped writing in her book of ages and left those pages blank was because she had begun to question her faith. The last entry she wrote after four members of her family, her husband, her favorite daughter, and two very young grandchildren that she was raising died in the space of 15 months. Lord, may I never be so rebellious as to refuse acquiescing. And she put down her pen. She never wrote in her book of ages again, not because she had nothing left to say, but because she did not want to blasphemy in writing it down. She found comfort in reading. She usually wrote her name in the books she owned, like her brother's experiments on electricity. She asked him once to send her all the pamphlets and papers that have been printed of your writing. She wanted, she said, to read all the political pieces he had ever written. He wrote back, I could as easily make a collection for you of all the past pairings of my nails. <laughs> but he sent what he could it was politics that she loved best because there was nothing that was less expected of a woman than to be interested in politics. It's quite fascinating. 
I keep your books of philosophy and politics by me, though I have read through them several times, she wrote. And when I am dull, I take one up and read, and it seems as though I were conversing with you or hearing you. I find a pleasure in that. She asked him, too, for books written by other authors, books she'd heard about and was keen to read. She read Swift and Pope, Addison and Sharp. She read newspapers and magazines. She read novels and history. She read sermons and speeches. She read whatever she could get her hands on with whatever moments she could snatch. She read until her eyes grew strained. If Jane's eyes were like those of either of her brothers, James or Benjamin, she would have needed reading glasses by the age of 24, at which point she had a house of six children, one of whom had already died, so only five, I believe, at that point. Women did not commonly wear spectacles. It's not just that they're not seen in, in portraits, but if you look at probate inventories, the inventories taken of everything in the house when someone dies, if it's a house only of women, there's almost never eyeglasses among their possessions. So you can kind of look at the ratios here. Uh, it's fascinating to see this doesn't begin to change until the end of the 18th century. In 1771, then, Jane asked her brother to send her spectacles. She had to ask for them. She wanted them. He was living in London. He sent her those 13 pairs. That same year, 1771, Massachusetts, for the first time, required that girls be taught to write. Support for, children, for girls' education grew after the Revolution. Jane and Benjamin were both brought, tangled up in a revolution of ideas about all kinds of things, including the idea that girls should be educated. It was very much a revolution of the 18th century. With a rise in women's education came a rise in women's ownership of eyeglasses. All these portraits that I've been showing you, these are all from the 1780s and 1790s. There's nothing earlier. These are both from 1787. In the company of books and in the company of her own mind, Jane found wisdom. The revolution made her a radical. A reader who liked politics and philosophy best, she absorbed some of the most radical ideas of the 18th century. I want to just tell you one story about one book that she read. In 1786, when she was 74, she put on her spectacles and read a book called Four Dissertations, written by Richard Price, a Welsh clergyman and political radical and friend of Benjamin Franklin's. One objection to the idea that everything in life is fated by providence, Price wrote, is the failure to thrive. Many perish in the womb, and even more are nipped in the bloom. An elm produces 330,000 seeds a year, but very few of these seeds ever grow into trees. A spider lays 600 eggs, and yet few grow into spiders. So too for humans, Price observed. Thousands of Boyles, Clarks, and Newtons, that is, geniuses like Isaac Newton, have probably been lost to the world and lived and died in ignorance merely for want of being placed in favorable situations and enjoying proper advantages. At her desk with Richard Price's four dissertations pressed open, with her spectacles resting on her nose, Jane wrote a passionate letter to her brother. Dr. Price thinks thousands of Boyles, Clarks, and Newtons have probably been lost to this world. Was that spoke to her? To this, she added an opinion of her own, because by the time she was 74, she was no longer stingy with her opinions. <laughs> Very few we know is able to beat through all impediments and arrive to any great degree of superiority in understanding. Who can rise above such a difficult beginning? Very few. Benjamin Franklin knew, and his sister knew, that very few ever beat through a life begun at such a disadvantage. 300,000 seeds to make one elm, 600 eggs to make one spider, of the 17 children of Josiah Franklin, how many beat through? We used to think only one, but I think two. A pair, like a pair of eyes that are not fellows. Jane Franklin died in 1794 in Boston. What remains of her life? Her book of ages is stored in an archive in Boston. It's a miracle that it survives. Her spectacles are lost, as are all of her things. Of the hundreds of letters she wrote to her brother, 63 years of that correspondence, more than half of her letters have been lost. Many of them may have been destroyed by Jared Sparks, Harvard's first professor of history, and later Harvard's president, who collected and edited Benjamin Franklin's papers in the 1820s and 1830s. 
he had particular reasons to destroy Jane's side of the correspondence. The bulk of the correspondence, in fact, only appeared in 1928, when 59 letters were auctioned at Sotheby's of London. In 1928, the year those letters were auctioned in London, Virginia Woolf turned her attention to the question of women as writers. She had just finished writing Orlando, a parody of biography that took up themes she had long wrestled with, especially in an essay called The Lives of the Obscure, a meditation on the lives of nobodies. Virginia Woolf's father was a, a founding editor of the Dictionary of National Biography, and uh, she was obsessed with the lives of the obscure, not the lives of the famous, in defiance of her father. She went through bookstop, bookstore after bookstore writing that essay, looking for stories about the lives of the obscure. In October of 1928, Wolf delivered a series of lectures to women undergraduates at Cambridge University. Those were soon after published as a room of one's own. In one of those essays, she asked, what would have happened had Shakespeare had a wonderfully gifted sister called Judith? I've always wondered where she got that idea. And I think that that fall, Virginia Woolf casting about for ideas for a lecture series rummaging about in bookstores looking for lives of the obscure, came across a catalog from Sotheby's of London, slumbering upon a shelf, in which an entry read, a most remarkable and extensive series of letters written by Benjamin Franklin to his sister Jane. But I like to think that in order to read those words, in order to imagine both Judith and William Shakespeare, to see both Jane and Benjamin Franklin, Virginia Woolf had to do something that she did not often do in front of a camera she had first to put on her spectacles. Thank you. I would be happy, uh, if you need to get up and go, people are anxious, it's a long lecture, that's fine, but if people have questions, I'd be happy to answer a couple of questions. Yeah, back there. Yes, yes. The question was, did, do I think it's possible that Jane lost her virginity before marriage and maybe that's why she married? I think it's extremely likely. I'm a quite cautious historian, so I didn't speculate in the book too much about that. I more or less speculate in a footnote. But think about it this way. She's 15 years old. In order to marry this guy, she has to have her parents' approval because you can't marry on your own until you're 16. He lives next door. He's no stranger to her parents. He's much older than she is. He's probably already clearly a layabout. He may already be a drunk and seem unstable. There's no, even if none of those things are true, even if it's just some poor older guy who lives next door, you're not gonna say to your daughter, oh fine, sure, you're 15, who can, you know, that, that, there's no explanation for why they would have, would have done that unless she were pregnant. Uh, at the time, in, that, in those decades in Massachusetts, a third of all brides were pregnant. So there's an enormous amount of premarital sex. It's quite common. You just, you just then get married. Uh, Jane had no problem with fertility. Like, it's unusual that, uh, that she, it actually there's a long gap between her marriage and her first child. It's two full years. Uh, that's, she doesn't go two years without having a child really for the rest of her life, you know, until menopause. So I think she probably married him uh, pregnant and then lost the baby so it's not recorded, you know which is you know, a, a tough decision to have made. Now, if she had been raped, which also seems possible, but I have no reason to believe that to be so, if she had been raped and found herself pregnant, she is in a very bad situation because the ideas of, about conception at the time, people believed that if a woman got pregnant, she had to have an orgasm. That, that actually, the, the conception required the orgasm of both partners, which is kind of a good thing in some ways when you think about it. <laughs> Uh, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, it was a problem if you were raped and became pregnant because you were legally not able to, to, to offer the charge of rape. So the, 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 the best thing to do for your child in, some, in many ways would be really actually to marry the rape. I mean, it's, it's a horrible, horrible idea. Um, but the, none of this is something that as a historian, I, I would, I, she spent decades living with this person and had 12 children by him. It's not for me to know. I don't know. I can, you know, I can wonder 
and I, you know, remark about it in a footnote, but it's quite mysterious. The only other clue that was actually pretty interesting, Jared Sparks, who collected Franklin's papers, interviewed uh, one of Jane's granddaughters, whose name was also Jane Meekham, and uh, he was just trying to figure out people who might have Franklin's letters. He was trying to trace all of people that Franklin might have corresponded with, and he asked her um, for the names, and for the number of children that Jane had and all their names. And she said, oh, my grandmother Jane had 13 children. And she actually had 12. But this is like 1824, and it's a granddaughter. How would she know? You know, I don't know. But it, it seems possible that there was some other pregnancy there. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but I'm obsessed with this question and frustrated that I couldn't resolve it. Yeah. Oh, um, the question was, how did I become a staff writer for The New Yorker? Uh, I don't know. These things are mysterious. It feels to me, you know those, um, those kind of cheesy Renaissance paintings where the hand of God comes down from the clouds? <laughs> That's how. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's very kind of you to say. Um, a, a, an article that the, of mine that was in the New Yorker over the summer was called The Prodigal Daughter. And it's about half of it is about the relationship between Jane and Benjamin Franklin, and the other half of it is about my relationship with my mother. And the stories are kind of braided through together. Um, and uh, Jane's the prodigal daughter, but more I'm the, pro the prodigal daughter in the story. Um, my, I'm the youngest of four children, and my mother, uh, who was wonderfully uh, happily married to my father for 55 years and uh, was very happy raising us, also felt, as many women, if she married in 1956, uh, she had wanted to be an artist, and she gave up, up a lot um, in the set of choices that were available to her, and she was always kicking me in the pants to tell me to get out of the get out and do things and that this would be the way to honor which she hadn't been able to do was for me to do which is an experience I think many 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 women have uh, or I now believe that many women have this relationship with their mothers because so many people wrote me these incredibly <coughs> moving letters after that essay appeared and writing about their mothers and what their mothers the incredible love and sacrifice that their mothers had made for them and in any case, my mother really wanted me to write this book about Jane Franklin because she thought it was important and she, 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 my mother was tough. So, you know, when I was like, I can't possibly write it, there's no letters. <laughs> Just do it. What do you, stop your whining. You know, my mother would, really is not like, get up and do it. Um, and, uh, but I kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And last year, uh, the very beginning of 2012, my father died and I realized I had put it off for too long and I tried very hard to write the book as fast as I could. Um, and then my mother died, um, really, of grief at my father's death. So I didn't finish the book. Uh, or, you know, it has, it's not out yet. But um, she didn't get a chance to read it. But, uh, but it's a monument to my mother. Yeah. You mentioned the 58 letters. Approximately how many letters were, were yeah. altogether? Yes. The question, how many letters were found altogether? Uh, I wish I had that off the top of my head. The book which is available in the hall, has an appendix that's a complete calendar of the letters. That is to say, uh, every letter that was known to have been written, um, indicating whether it survives or doesn't survive. Some of the letters, um, I classify them, they're, they're about 350 altogether uh, in the correspondence, which is a pretty big number. But again, uh, half of those are from Jane, you know, so that's like about 100, and then so like about 75 of Jane's are missing, right? Um, some, some of them that are, missing were once seen and copied down, like Sparks would copy down parts of them. Uh, and then some of them have just never been seen by anybody. And I have the secret fantasy that some of them will turn up. <laughs> Someone will like hear the radio, some, this Lepore being interviewed on the radio about this Jane Meekham, and I have a letter from Jane Meekham in my attic. And they'll all, so you know, spread the word, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's a great question because no one has asked you, how did they end up in London? <laughs> it's not like Jane ever went to London. So what happened was um, Jane, what was found, those ones that were auctioned in London were actually Franklin's letters, not Jane's. But Jane kept Franklin's letters very carefully 
and a little trunk. And when she died, she left them with her minister, who was also a librarian of sorts. He was the keeper of the cabinet of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, in fact. And he kept them and gave, to split them between his two daughters. Right? This is what I'm largely speculating from this, this whole appendix. Of, I'm big on appendices. Split them between his two daughters. One of his daughters had a son who went to England and then his daughter married like the home secretary or something. And anyway, she, they, the family, one branch of the family moved to England and they had half of, Frank, uh, of, of what was in this one collection of Jane's Letters of Franklin's. And then when the last of the descendants died in 1928, the estate was auctioned. Uh, and it was, it was a very valuable collection. And it went actually then into private hands, but the cool thing is, and the reason that Jane's part of the correspondence survives at all, as you may have heard of Carl Van Doren, very important biographer, literary biographer of the first half of the 20th century. He was an editor of the American Dictionary of Biography. Franklin, uh, Van Doren wrote this beautiful biography of Benjamin Franklin that was published in 1938 and won the Pulitzer Prize. He had become completely obsessed with Jane while writing this biography which in much the same way, that he felt much the same way that I do about Jane. And he dedicated the rest of his life to trying to find her into the correspondence. <laughs> he said it was a belated act of justice. And he bought the collection that had been auctioned at Auth Sotheby's and bought by a private collector. He got himself on the library committee of the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. He was a great philanthropist and a great uh, dedicated member of the spirit of an institution like this purchased those letters, brought them to Philadelphia so that they would be in a public archive, and then hunted everywhere. That, like that, um, that edition of Benjamin Franklin's Observations and Experiments on Electricity that's Jane's, that was Jane's copy, Van Doren found that. It's, I found it in his papers. I mean, he, he, he couldn't give it up. <laughs> he actually was so happy to find it. That it's with his papers at Princeton. Um, but he, one of hers survives because of him, so he published posthumously this little collection of their correspondence. Uh, he, he, he found the Book of Ages. I mean, it would have been findable. It ended up in an, a genealogical society library in Boston, you know, which, which is where it still is. But it was this incredibly heroic act because he was so furious. And what got him really furious, I'll, one, one last detail to answer this question. In 1939, the year that, that Van Dorn won the Pulitzer for the biography of Franklin, um, Jane's house in the North End, uh, which is this little brick house that Franklin bought for her that she adored, was demolished to make, to improve the view between the equestrian statue of Paul Revere and the old North Church. It, it wasn't in the way. It was just like, you know that like postcard sight line you've probably seen, you have Revere on the horse and this church steeple in the back, the one if by land. So for the sake of that postcard, Jane's house was demolished. <laughs> Van Dorn was like, I've had it. I'm going to collect this woman's letters, and I'm going to save her for the ages. Yeah. You mentioned that many of her letters were destroyed with good reason. What yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to know when something's missing why it was missing. But when Jared Sparks went around, he went around not just to Boston, Philadelphia. He went to London and Paris collecting Franklin's papers. He's also the guy who collected George Washington's papers. When he went around looking for, for Benjamin Franklin's papers, he met members of Jane's family, and they all refused to give him her papers. They didn't trust him, and for good reason, it turns out. But in any case, one reason the letters don't get saved or captured is because Jane's granddaughter and her minister's family are unwilling to really share them with Sparks. Um, but he does copy some out, and he does end up having some. Uh, a good reason he might have destroyed them, well, two good reasons. One is it would have been clear to him how important this person was to Franklin's life and how intricate and uh, important this relationship was, I guess, basically. And Jane is a very, uh, is a, comes across as a, quite an illiterate person. She can be crude. Um, and this, in Sparks' high-minded view of what Franklin should look like for posterity, didn't comport well. More to the point, she was, would it, the years that are missing from her correspondence are when her husband was in debtor's prison and when her sons were going mad. And Franklin was very involved in the care of her insane sons because he had to help find a place for them to be put. And I think that Sparks would have, uh, he would have been quite upset at Franklin being associated with insanity in any way. 
So it's, you know, it's, possible, it's possible that they were destroyed by sparks. It's possible that Franklin also just lost them in a completely understandable, I mean, Franklin had hundreds of correspondence. Jane only had him. So she's going to keep the letters he sends is much more likely, right? Whereas Franklin's traveling all over the world that he could lose things is, 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 is an equally likely explanation. So I don't think there's necessarily something sinister there. But Sparks is later revealed and it becomes quite a controversy uh, in 1851. Someone finally discovers that he has bowdlerized Washington and Franklin's papers. Uh, Washington is quite famously a very poor writer. Uh, Jared Sparks was a literary editor and he just changed all of Washington's prose to make Washington seem like a fine writer. Uh, this was quite scandalous. He was accused of uh, propping the president on stilts, uh, painting him with patriotic rouge. I mean, it was quite a scandal. And, and, and uh, Sparks was unable to defend himself against him. Mean, he attempted to defend himself. He had done much the same. Well, he'd done that degree of intervention with Franklin's writing. But Franklin's a brilliant writer. He didn't improve his writing. He just took out all the filthy jokes. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much.